In order to be able to fully learn about and discuss type, we're going to need to learn and talk about the different terminology that is used when describing type. And we're also going to need to learn about the letter form anatomy of type. So we'll be looking at all of the items that are diagrammed here. Um, I'm going to break it down into more bite-sized pieces so it'll be a little bit easier to digest. But this kind of gives you an overview of what we're going to look at. Let's go ahead and start. Understanding the fundamental principles and concepts of typography is the first step to making better use of type. The most basic component of typography is the letter. Each letter of the alphabet is unique and can be distinguished by its own shape and letter form. The baseline is the imaginary horizontal line in which the majority of all characters of a typeface sit. The cap line is the imaginary horizontal line resting upon the tops of the uppercase letters. And the mean line is the imaginary horizontal line that designates the height of the lowercase letters. X height. The size of the body of the characters epitomized by the letter X is the X height. Since X is the only letter that reaches out to all four corners of the space. The X height creates the impression of font sizes. Most of what you see on any given typeface is the X height, excluding the ascenders and descenders. Ascenders are the things that go above the mean line and descenders drop down below the baseline. Um, the X height is what gives a font face its visual impact. X height can vary considerably among typefaces with the same point size. You can see to the right right here I have three different font faces. They're actually all set at the exact same point size. The first one is Adobe Castellan Pro. Um, this is Century Gothic right here. And this is Zapfino. Um, you'll notice that the degrees and variances between the sizes and the styles. But definitely they don't all always reach to the mean line. Some of them extend above and even some of them may go below the baseline as well. Let's go ahead and look at these letter form parts. Um, the apex is shown right here on the top of this letter A. It's the uppermost point of a character where the vertical strokes meet. There are different apex types, such as rounded, pointed, hollow, flat, and extended. This is an example of a hollow apex. The arm is the horizontal portion of a letter form one or both ends of which are unattached to the vertical portions. The ascender is a portion of a lowercase letter form that ascends above the X height of the typeface. So this portion of the F is the ascender. The descender is the portion of the lowercase letter form that descends below the baseline. In some typefaces, the uppercase J and uppercase Q also descend below the baseline. A beak is similar to a spur, which we'll look at momentarily, but it's slightly larger. The projection is extends from the endpoints of the uppercase L, uppercase T, or uppercase E. And this right here is just an example of a thin stroke, and it's sometimes just called a thin. So you can see how this A has a thin stroke on this uh, left side, and then a thicker stroke on the right side. The bowl is the curved portion of the letter form that encloses a counter. The exception is in the lower curved portion of a lowercase g, which is actually referred to as a loop, and we'll look at that momentarily. A bracket is the curve that connects the serif to the stem or the stroke, and it's sometimes called a fillet. The counter Here's our counters right here, the lower portion of the E and inside of the D is the negative space of the letter form. A counter may be either fully or partially enclosed, as shown in these two examples. A tail is the ascending, often decorative stroke on the letter Q, or the descending, often curved diagonal stroke on a K, capital K, or a capital R. These are also referred to as the tail. The descenders on lowercase g, j, p, and q, and y are also called tails. And a terminal is the end of a stroke which does not terminate in a serif. 
The stress is the direction in which curved stroke changes weight, and you can clearly see that happening in this O right here. The weight of the stroke is very thick, and then it gets thinner right through here, and thinner right through here, so this is referred to as the stress line. The I is the enclosed portion of a lowercase e. The ear is the small decorative projection that comes off um, from the upper right hand side of a lowercase g, in some fonts anyways. The loop is the curved part of a lowercase g that encloses the lower counter. And the link is the part of the lowercase g that connects the loop and the bowl. A crossbar is the horizontal part of a letter form that connects, for example, the stem or hairline. So these are stems on either side of the H, and then the crossbar connects these. A cross stroke is the horizontal part of a letter form that intersects the vertical part. This is also sometimes referred to as a bar, and you can find bars and cross stroke cross strokes on characters like capital A, capital H, capital T, lowercase e, lowercase f, and lowercase t. The leg is the lower angled stroke on a K or on a capital R. The spine is the curved stroke on a letter S. The spur is a small projection that extends from the end point of a curved portion of a letter form. The spur is always smaller than a serif. And the aperture is a partially enclosed, somewhat rounded negative space in certain characters such as N, lowercase n, that is capital C, capital S, the lower part of an E, or the upper part of a double story A, as shown here. The tittle is the dot on a lowercase i or j. A two-story character is a letter that has two counter spaces where one is above the other. A stem is the main vertical stroke of a letter. Um, it's most evident in capital I's and capital H's, and sometimes this is referred to as the main stroke as well. The serif is the small finishing stroke on arms, stems, and tails of characters. And you can see that I have serifs here on the I, serifs on the V, serifs on my N. Okay. Traditional serif typefaces are considered better for large volumes of text because the serifs make it easier for the eye to move along horizontally. And we're going to talk more about this in depth in an upcoming lecture. The shoulder is the curved stroke on an H, an M, or an N, and those are lowercase letter forms. A ligature is two set of two or more characters that have been designated into a harmonious set. Originally, they were designed to control letter spacing in situations where two or more letters take up too much space and they have an uncomfortable feeling to the viewer. In olden days, these characters were created by carving into the actual wood block or having parts of the characters extend beyond their block into the space of another character. If you look for, uh, take for instance the lowercase f, this character seems to conflict with the lowercase characters who have ascenders. So if you look how it fits with the lowercase i, for instance, or the lowercase t or l, um, with a well-designated lit ligature, these characters now have a more natural feeling, and the reading can flow effort. The reader can flow effortlessly through them. So here's what an F and an I look like without using the ligature, and you can see it just kind of is like an awkward ink spot right there. The ligature is this connection, and you can see that the lowercase I actually loses its dot. It doesn't really need it because it's kind of combined. So if you use the um, if you compare these two examples right here, this example is not using ligatures, and you can see we have a lot of instances like the F going into the I, the F going into the F, and going into the L. It's just a kind of awkward transitions. Over here, the example on the right, it looks much cleaner and everything seems to fit together uh, much nicer. So you can see that the ligatures are definitely helpful to use. Those are ligatures kind of come pre um, like formed in many fonts. Many open all the open type fonts pretty much have ligatures in there for you too. So if you get a good font, it'll kind of be built into the font. You don't have to do much with it. 
There's uh, a couple more important terms that I want to talk about. Um, body copy is text in sizes that range from about 8 point to 12 point. There are paragraph text is usually set um, in this size. 10 point is usually a good average size to set body copy at and this is particularly for printed work. You never want to go above 12 point though for your body copy. Display type is text in sizes above 25 points and it's used in headlines or advertising titles. Roman is type that does not slant. This is Roman type that you're seeing right here in this uh, write-up. Italic is a style of type where the letters slant to the right. Most serif faces have true italic versions. This means that the letters have been redesigned. So you can see right here, this is an example of Adobe Castellan Pro, and the first example of each letter is set in Roman, the second example is set in italic, and you can see how the italic examples all kind of slant over to the right a little bit. Oblique type is just um, is just slanted. It's typical of most sans serif italic, italic faces, but not all. So in in the ita true italic types, the actual font itself has been redesigned, and you can see it's very um, apparent in the A, where we have a two-story A here, and then just a one-story A here, but it looks very different from the italic form to the regular form. And that's true with the H, too. You can see how the H has actually been reformed, as well as the G. Over here in Century Gothic, we have Roman and italic fonts, but you can see that the italic fonts are simply just a slanted version of the Roman fonts, so there is no real difference in the actual styling. The letters have not been redesigned as they have up above in the top example. So hopefully that gives you a good overview of different various parts of letters. You are going to become more familiar with this terminology as we go through our section on 